Good afternoon, it's a Monday. My name's Kevin Graham and welcome to your Axe on Bulletin. And usual on a Monday, Amy Canavan is joining us. Amy, how are you getting on today? I'm doing all right, Kev. Delighted to be back on with yourself. We had a lot of fun a few weeks ago, didn't we? So, we um, did, I'm yes. delighted to be back going. Aye. Uh, how was your weekend? But uh, Obviously, the, the weekend was... In the men's football game, anyway, it was a Champions League final. Um, it was a wee bit of a damp squib, I think, anyway, towards the end of it. Uh, I think after 75 minutes, you kind of knew that Liverpool weren't going to equalise or take the, game into, take the game into extra time. But off the field again, Amy, and we can put tribal associations aside. We seem to have had another incident where football fans from this country uh, are treated differently <laughs> when, when they actually go abroad. I was thinking about this just before I came back on. And uh, quite a few years ago now, uh, I went to Rennes to watch Celtic. That was the day of Chaduri's immense OG from the half <laughs> line. Um, I, that was unbelievable. That, that. Um, so... But I remember when we were going into the stadium and Wrens getting kettled into one gate to go through and get the checks. And that came back to me there when I've been listening to the Liverpool fans speak about their, their experiences outside the stadium and that and the, the ticket checks trying to get in. And I know people are, are sort of blaming uh, ticketless fans, but I'm no, let's, let's not beat about the bush here. If Celtic got to a Champions League final and you didn't have a ticket, there would be fans trying to jib in. That is going to happen. It just seems to have been badly organised. And the guys, we're good friends with the guys for the Anfield Rap podcast. Yes. And they've been saying outside the stadium was absolutely horrific on the way back to the, on the way after the game. There was muggins, there, there was people getting held up by gunpoint. It was extremely, it was extremely moody, was as, as John from Anfield Rap put it. It just seems to have been an utter shambles, eh? It was a shambles. And for a second, you know, you can, I think Andy Robertson actually said as well, you, you do slightly have to feel for, for Paris. It was chucked, them on, or chucked upon them at the last minute as final, obviously, um, with Russia and Ukraine. But then sympathy, in that sense, kind of goes out the window quite quickly. This isn't a minuscule stadium that I've never hosted anything of this kind of scale before. I think I, I could be wrong, but I'm sure I've read um, this week that no stadium, no city has hosted more, you know, uh, like finals and, and obviously European finals, World Cup finals than, than the Stade de France. You're not telling me that, you know, I understand it was short notice, but it wasn't like a day or so. It has been now weeks, if not months now, actually, mm -hmm. that it has since been moved to France. So, yeah, I understand that it was a little bit thrown upon them, but there, there really can be no excuse. Um, this is a, a top, top class stadium, you know, in a, in a huge European city. There's no two ways about it. And, and the treatment is, is disgusting. And it's really rather alarming. You know, Kev, you've got kids. Um, wasn't that long ago. I was the kid um, with my dad in, in grounds. Um, and, you know, when you're a child and, and you're going to games with your, with your parents or whoever it may be, they're the memories that stick with you, you know, even just going through to Glasgow, my dad having to hold my hand as tight as possible. You, you're told, you know, you don't don't leave sight, don't do anything like that. Um, but the experience of, of tear gas, obviously, is something that I've I've no, thankfully, no experience of. But that's going to scar a child. Um, and would I want to go back to the football? I'm not so sure. I don't think I'd want to certainly be going to, to Paris anytime soon. Um, and I, I think it's interesting. Yesterday at the Lyon women game, um, there was an Leon PSG, there was a flat a, a banner up and it translated basically, you know, French police, the, the world has seen what, what what your true colours basically. Uh, I wish I could remember it word for word, but I, I think a lot is going to come out of this. You know, it was a huge weekend for French sport. Everything has happened in, in France. There was the uh, just before the, the Champions League final, it was the, the rugby European Championships, I think. Don Mackay's presenting the medals. Um, you know, they had the scenes, I don't know if anyone's seen the scenes at St Etienne yesterday, their relegation that's really poor policing again, um, that's that's a totally different topic but there's there's a lot of attention on France right now but to go back to the Champions League final, yeah it was a, it was a rather damp game but I think that the mood was really set with the 
with the multiple postponements, the mood around the stadium, you know, I think you've heard players afterwards have concern for their families or friends. Did they get in? Did they not? You know, again, Andy Robertson, I know he's the example I see me keep using, but his friend got told it was a fake ticket and he's like, well, it's came for me, for the club, so it can't be fake. Um, so I, I think it's it's a really sour taste that's been left in the mouth. I think I don't think the last has been said on it. Um, and I think a, a real kudos, again, maybe this is biased from my perspective, but a lot to journalists um, who were actually on the ground and done proper real journalistic work you know I don't UEFA like to ring around the stadium didn't they and say that it was because fans turned up late well there were fans there four or five hours in advance it was due to the late arrival so I think journalists were really telling the true stories the real stories um off the off the fans that were there because their, their voices deserve to be heard because you know you spend an awful lot of money um, to get out there, the, the, the prices of these tickets, that were, the, the figures that were getting flown around were, were ridiculous. So to see all that, exactly, and, and to get, well, for many not even getting before half time, it's, um, it was not a great weekend for UEFA at all. It's not been a great week, actually, for UEFA. I don't think any finals went to, to plan, has it? No, no, it has, hasn't it really. And again, this is not a Liverpool thing. This is not a Rangers thing. No. This is a this is a, this is a football fan thing. The way UEFA treat fans, and what we're talking about here, you've talked about fans turning up without t- tickets. Brown Warrior comes in and goes, UEFA treat fans like they do players, livestock heading to the slaughterhouse. I mean, we're talking about the fact as you've got a. 90,000 seat a stadium in the Champions League final, or even if we go back to the Europa League final, a 40,000 seat a stadium, and both clubs only get 9,000 tickets. That is going to create an, un, a, a, an, an unquestionable demand, and you are going to get people without tickets travelling, and they are going to try to get in. You ever need to have a look at that. You ever have to actually have a look at, like, how they organise these things, where they organise. I mean, Paris, it's a multicultural city. It's not as if, it's not the bizarre decision to take the UEFA Conference League a final to Albania in a, in a stadium which was, I can't remember even what that state stadium held. But UEFA have to have a look at this. And this is a football fan thing. If football fans didn't join together and st- step up against UF and the organisations that run our game, then they're just going to walk over the top of us and we'll carry on being treated like this. I've been to watch Celtic plenty of times in Europe and we'll all have stories of place in Amsterdam the last couple of times I've been in Amsterdam has been utterly shocking. I remember my first European trip was to uh, in Lisbon, 1992, Amy. 1992 was my oh, first okay. European trip. And George Cadetti scored two goals against us that night, which is oh, which a couple of years later he ended up playing for us. And as we were walking out the stadium, the stadium in Lisbon, if you went up to try and ask what a policeman something, they just battened you. And that was my first European trip. Everybody will have will have a story traveling all over Europe, and it doesn't matter if. It's good, bad, or what team it is. Football fans sometimes need to actually like stand together against the brutality um, that that we get shown when we are abroad, and even sometimes the treatment we get in our own country. Anyway, it was a great day for the Celtic women's team yesterday. Um, double cup winners. A record-breaking attendance, I believe, at Tyne Castle as well. Yeah, for, a, for a cup final, yeah, for any domestic cup final, yeah, absolutely. And we can really say that ten women won the cup, Amy. I'm going to, I'm going to let you lead on this because I must admit I, I'm not an expert. I'm not even an expert on the men's team, <laughs> and I'm definitely not an expert on the women's team. I just feel that I've got that much going on in my brain that I didn't really give them the time that they actually like deserve. I've seen the highlights from yesterday. What a, what a fantastic performance by the women's side. Eh? Absolutely outstanding, Kev. Honestly, um, that's one of one of the best performances I've seen from any male or female side um, with 10 players. Absolutely incredible. Um, to play near enough 80 minutes, 
because uh, Jody Bartle got sent off just about five minutes to go in the first half of, of regulation time. So to go whole second half and then additional time, well, extra time, sorry, um, with, with 10 players was was unbelievable. And it was it was a fantastic game. It really had it all. Um, I guess, yeah, I was working and I didn't get a moment's rest in that first half. Four goals and they came right after each other. You know, Celtic take the lead and then City equalised really rather easily a little bit too sloppy kind of like Celtic male team a bit sceptical from set pieces still um, and then two penalties right after each other Celtic again getting one first Charlie Wellings hitting 40 goals for the season my goodness 40 goals eh? That's 40 something goals something. and you didn't win a player of the year award it's crazy eh? uh, not for the PFA or, or for club but no she's been an unbelievable find um, that's I think it's quite easy to say that's Fran Alonso's best um, signing for for Celtic. Nick uh, from from Bristol City. I don't know if Celtic will be able to keep a hold of her. You know, our, our numbers speak for herself. Um, Forty goals at, at any level is absolutely incredible. So, um, and for Saturday, Sundays, yeah, yesterday was our first goal not from open play as well. So to do it from the penalty spot um, again, you know, so thirty nine goals all season from open play, it's crazy, crazy numbers. And then yeah, Celtic get taken down to ten men. I personally think it's a little bit soft. I do. Pat I, Dolan I, comes in and says Celtic player sent off, never a pen, never a red. It was you know Chinchilla, she she wins a a, a decent. Penalty is it's a little bit a nudge for Jody Bartle, but is it enough to to be a? I don't know. It's it's the kind of the double punishment. There was a lot of uncertainty, um, but you know it, it actually I think really spurred Celtic on. I think what has to be said as well, their unbelievable support certainly did. You know, I don't know the exact numbers of how many were were Celtic fans, but off oh, out of the four was it four three two five. Um, uh, you know, I would put my money on a more more than seventy percent of them being Celtic support, and in that first half in particular, so so vocal. And then, yeah, second half, you expect Glasgow City. You know, they've had a stranglehold on uh, SWPL for, for the last fourteen years. Obviously, lost that this year to Rangers. It now seems to be well, not seems to be. It now is. It's their first um, trophyless season since two thousand and three, I think. Um, so you know, this is it's a really actually a dark day for Glasgow City. But in the second half, they never really showed an awful lot. You know, Celtic managed to, to suck up any kind of pressure really rather well. You could see what they were trying to do rather direct, trying to get Wellings on the ball, Jacinta as well. Um, and yeah, you, if there's a few occasions that called offside, and if they weren't, in, they're in the back of the net. Charlie Wells had a fantastic opportunity with probably about 90 seconds to go in regulation time still and she, she misses an open goal so to go into extra time I'll be honest that the goal that wins it is the Atkinson it's, it's a phenomenal finish it's a phenomenal goal the scenes are incredible and yeah it's the first time I think Celtic have been in the Scottish Cup final since 2008 and it's the first time in their history that they've won it so to do the cup double it's absolutely outstanding um it's been it's been a tricky season, you know. Obviously, Rangers have, have kind of you can't say ran away with the league because Glasgow City only lost one game and held them right away till right till the death. But they didn't ever really look like slipping up, you know. They've went unbeaten, um, and for a Celtic perspective in the league, it's probably been a little bit disappointing in the fact that never been able to beat Rangers in the league, but knocked them out of both cups. You know, that's and beat Glasgow City in both cup finals now as well. So a lot of positives have to be taken from that that they can battle away and beat these two the other top two um, just needs to be translated really into, into league form but there was a little bit of disappointment as well obviously Celtic missing out on Champions League football this season uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a bummer but for the cup double you know you just need to look at Fran Alonso's celebrations yesterday this means everything to them um, and, I, and I think it's more than deserved that they have a, a fantastic two fantastic achievements really to show um because it was like it was a great game yesterday, and yeah, I have to say, but with ten players, no side deserved it more. Fran Fran Alonso, eh? Sela, Johnny Ryan comes in. His celebration was unbelievable at, at, at that goal, and we've been lucky enough that we've spent time with him. Eh? The channel spent yeah. time with him, eh? and he has got the same sort of passion as Posta Coglu, ain't he? He's bought oh, into the club. He, he, he's that. bought into the club big style, and. What's next for Celtic? You, you, you mentioned that there's a bit of disappointment they were going to the Champions League last year, but obviously this year there does seem to be a feeling that the guard's changing in, in women's football now and it is going to be Rangers and Celtic. Would I be right in saying that as an outsider looking in? 
I am. I think it's a tricky one. You can never write off Glasgow City. You really can't. There's been a lot happened this season. You know, obviously Scott Booth left, um, and that was yeah, that, that that was a huge moment. You know, he's brought so much success. I think over the last eight years, could be wrong. Um, so. It was always going to be a little bit difficult. Eileen Gleason didn't really come in until closer to Christmas, actually. She had to finish off a post in, in Northern Ireland. Um, so th- there's not, there's been that little bit of uncertainty. And I think it, it's tricky because the players that have probably been at Glasgow City for so long, it's because, you know, it's the only club that they could really, you know, apply their trade professionally. Um, and, you know, they, they were running away at a canter. You know, if you were going to play in Scotland, you were going to play for Glasgow City. But you're now seeing players who have grown up Celtic and Rangers fans um, and, and they're wanting to go and play for that club and you can understand why and it's, it's women that have actually probably started their, their careers off there in the first place you know Rangers having Lizzie Arnott and Jane Ross it's two unbelievable signings Nicola Dockett has been there for a few years now again ex-Glasgow City but City have struggled this year Joe Loves the, the, the captain has been out I think actually all season, if not from right from the very start, um, Hayley Lauder has take, taken on the captaincy ex- expertly well. You know, she's been in the game for for so long. In my eyes, I don't understand how she's done that in the Scotland setup, but I think that's confusion reigns along uh, uh, amongst a lot of folk. Actually, um, it's not like she's retired internationally, so so nobody really knows why. Pedro Martinez also doesn't really select her for for the national side, but things are changing. You know, it's the the SWPL is now moving under um, SPFL, so that's this is a, this is a huge moment now that everything's kind of coming amalgamated. It's a it's a bigger league next year. There was no relegation. You've got uh, Dundee United coming up and and Glasgow. Glasgow girls and Glasgow women coming up, um, so it's going to be a bigger league. You've got Hearts and and, and Aberdeen both having um, moving into that more more um, semi pro kind of uh, setup. Certain players are, are making that move. Aberdeen are, are investing or managing to keep really a lot of young players. Their their core group of players are actually all really under nineteen internationalists. They've got four or five start week in week out um, for the for the under 19s national setup. So everything is kind of changing in the women's game and it's a really exciting time. You know, the, they are getting a lot more coverage now. You're getting a game on Alba once a week and mostly a game on the, the BBC website as well. Um, and I'll be honest, I'm absolutely delighted to be at the forefront of that and you're, you're getting the com- the uh, highlight show as well on, on the Monday night. So things are changing. And like I say, I think for, for Celtic going into next season, uh, the huge question mark will will hang around uh, Charlie Whelan's neck if Celtic will be managing to keep her. You know, she is English. She did come from Bristol City, so there, there's no doubt going to be eyes on her The fact when she came up here in the first place. Um, so if you can keep a hold of her, then then that's going to be a, an absolutely massive um, coup. But if you lose her, it's going to be tricky. It is going to be tricky. There's no two ways about it because, like I say, Lizzie Arnott, Jane Ross at Rangers, they, they are terrific. And Chinchillas at Glasgow City is just an, an unbelievable uh, talent. She is uh, quite a frightening wee prospect. You mentioned losing Charlie Wellens. And that, what about Fran Alonso? Surely, oh. he, surely he'll be... Attracting attention from the bigger the bigger English leagues down south and maybe even in Europe, where like when you saw you saw the the crowds at the Champions League final between Lyon and Barcelona, the Barcelona fans seem to have really engaged with, with their women's side this season. Celtic and and Scotland have still got a long way to go to get to that level as well. Eh? But surely you look at Fran, you look at what he's done—a Champions League spot last season, two cups this season. I mean, where can he take Celtic or, or will he be looking maybe to move on as well? Or I think he's really bought into this, Kevin. I have to say, I, I do I do certainly hope that he stays. Um, there's actually, a, a give it a wee plug, but Heather Dewar had a fantastic interview with uh, with Fran in, in the mail um, this weekend. And, and it's it's unbelievable to, to chart his career path. You know, 15 years ago, he was still a gardener. And then he um, he was like, right, nope, I'm going to be a coach. I want to be a football coach. So he came over to England, was a cleaner at Bournemouth, eventually gets in the setup at Bournemouth, then at Southampton, works under Nigel Atkins, then Pochettino, darts around, kind of he's been at Everton. Um, there's been translator jobs, everything within uh, within everything in the club really. Um, but working with Pochettino and, and you know at the time an a absolutely um, hu- huge manager, even when he was at Southampton, probably had more yeah more kind of stake and stock about him back then. Um, it's kind of went a little bit quiet since having to go to PSG. 
and I say halfing. Um, so I, I do hope that France stays. I, I really do because I think you can see the enjoyment, and I think he wants more. You know, he wanted silverware. You can see that obviously he's managed to deliver that, but I think he wants to make a dent in the league. I really do. Um, and like I say, if he manages to bring in charms like. Uh, you know, Izzy Atkins, and who scores the winner, if he manages to bring in Charlie Wellings. Players, obviously not always of that calibre, but um, even already they, they have made a little bit of business. Amy Gallagher from Hibs, um, Patsy Gallagher's great-granddaughter, so we've already signed her. Um, and I, I, to be honest, I think that's a, it's a fantastic uh, steal. I've seen her a few times for Hibs. When she's on her game, she's really on her game, really influential. Kind of sits behind in that David Turnbull role, in all honesty. Um so if he can pick these little gems out, as Ange does as well, I have to say, I'd, I'd love for him to say to stay, and I, and I certainly hope he will. I hope he will as well. And Stephen Kenny comes in here, and this is something that I'm going to bring up as we move on to the next topic. Um, surprise fan never got a sniff at a gig in the man's game. Decent pedigree, knows more than that we weed at Livingston. No remember when Neil Lennon was given uh, was relieved of his duties. I think it was Colin Watt <laughs> on this channel. And if you says we could actually do worse than and than, than give Fran Alonso the actual gig. And it'll be interesting to see if if, if Fran if Fran ever does get a, a gig in the man's game, eh? But we've mentioned Neil Lennon. So we may as well bring him back in, eh? Mm. Uh, Neil Lennon was I kind of don't even know what he was on I've just actually seen the quotes I don't know what, sound. He was, was on it Sports BBC, Sound BBC Sports Sound yesterday yep. uh -huh. as I say I didn't even know what he was on I've just seen the quotes so mm -hmm. he, he's, he's gave his uh, to Bob worth about what Celtic need to do next season to compete in the Champions League or make a decent fist to the Champions League so right away, he says they need to spend. I I think that was quite obvious, Neil. I think they're I think they're in a, a need of a bit more power in the team. I think they need another centre forward to play through the middle, just a bit more physicality. Uh, they're small, but they're quick and dynamic players who use the ball really well. But when you take that huge step up from Scottish football to European football, they need more strength and depth. Losing Rogic was a blow because they're a mercurial type of player, so they'll need that number 10 to augment, augment what they have in the midfield. But they've got some potential now to spend decent money, but obviously they get a huge windfall from the Champions League. A couple of things there. We'll start with, we'll start with the number 10 thing. I don't know, as Mugby and Neil Lennon know seen Matt O'Reilly but he's been in Cyprus for the majority of the second half of the season. So I think Matt O'Reilly is a, is a replacement to, for Tom Rogic. But the guy who's on our title bar today, David Turnbull, I think it's between him and O'Reilly for the number 10 spot in an Ange Poster Coggle Celtic, unless we bring somebody else in. Um, I, do, I don't think we'll bring anybody else in at number 10. I think we're going to go with those two. I don't think that's where Celtic's priorities will lie in that number 10 position. I'm going out and on, on the hunt. Um, I, I think there are greater um, needs elsewhere uh, uh, along, along the, the, the kind of the, the starting lineup, actually, um, or any starting position. But yeah, odd comments, I think. Um, because, like you say, if Neil Lennon hasn't really seen an awful lot of Matt O'Reilly, then I don't really think he should be commenting. Um, you know, I completely understand he's out in Cyprus, but if he's not really totally up to date, I would just probably not um, comment on it from my situation. I totally understand, like I say, I was actually having to listen to it yesterday, so I, I'm aware that he was asked the questions and he's just given it his answer. Um, but I do think there are more immediate um, needs elsewhere, and, and I do think that Ange will go with between Turnbull and, and O'Reilly. I think he's shown post-Christmas how much that he loves um, Matt O'Reilly and really trusts Matt O'Reilly. Um, I find the fact that there was toss-ups here and there between him and Tom Rogic and you know if one was dropped it wasn't because of their own poor performance it was just because you know the other one is, is almost equally as good as each other um, and, I, and I was a, a Tom Rogic fan have been 
for forever actually um so for somebody to manage to come in at the the time that he did and make the immediate impact they had and really managed to challenge Tom Roberts speaks volumes and then pre-Christmas or pre-injury pre-cut final whatever you want to call it with David Turnbull he was the go-to man for Ange you know he started um I think he started five out of six games in, in Europa League um, in the group stage, came on in the last game against Betis, I think, so he certainly played a part in everything. Um, and I think there was a few 90-minute performances, if I'm right, in Europa League as well. He really was chucked about everywhere, almost as a false nine sometimes. He did play that that centre midfield role. But I think Ange has a lot of trust in him and, and really does like him. Um, he, like I say, he was he just the fact that he, he kind of was a, a guaranteed starter almost week in, week out under Ange, um, pre-injury speaks, speaks volumes. And then he's obviously been ble- bleeding his way back into the side um, post-injury. So I, I think I, I think he is more than comfortable with both Turnbull and, and O'Reilly. I would be. Um, it's just me. Um, so, yeah, let's see what the comments are saying. Gary Oliver, Gary Oliver, Kev saying Turnbull played because there was no one else to, not so sure about. Well, I understand where that comment's kind of coming from, um, but in the same breath, you know, Turnbull was trusted elsewhere, maybe where, where others could have came on, you know, the, the bench, I understand, was rather weak, that's when we used to speak about it quite often, um, that there was, um, you know, bairns on the bench, basically, but for um, but for, for Turnbull, I don't know, the, the comments are a little bit interesting, aren't they? Tur- Turnbull splits opinion, he does split yeah. opinion, and I think he's a decent guy to have in the squad, but there is an argument that if we want to make a dent in the Champions League, which we could be a couple of years away from even attempting to make a, a dent in the Champions League. Uh, let's not forget that the, then we should probably be looking better at Turnbull than uh, Turnbull and Matt O'Reilly. The thing is, both are young players, both can actually develop. And Poster Coglu's been, been, been on record as saying it's his job to develop players. And you've got to say that there's guys in that squad that you'll be looking to develop. I don't think we'll be looking to sign a number 10, not because I think the options that we've got are absolutely fantastic and they're top level. It is because I think there's other areas that are more pressing and need yes. to give a better balance to the team. And that's what some of the, the, the commenters are actually saying. Uh, Paul McLean, physicality at the back in the midfield is absolutely imperative. What I'm going to say is, if we're looking to sign a midfielder, Amy, we need a, a, a big, rangy, physical number six. And I'm not talking about, I've, I've noticed that there's a couple of names. The names that keep them coming back, Gary Olver keeps on bringing Van Yama and Scott Brown back. Eh? They're, they're the obvious ones because they're the ones that, that we've seen in a Celtic jersey. But for me... I'm looking for a sort of modern type, rangy, physical midfielder who can cover a lot of ground for the inverted fullbacks and all that. I'm looking at more a Fabinho type at Liverpool. I'm looking for that type of player, not just an absolutely enforcer, a guy who can actually do, has got an engine in him, basically. And I think we actually do lack that in the squad. And if we're looking at anybody this summer for the midfield, I think that's I think that's the the position that they've got to be looking at. Yeah, I think um, that's yeah that that that's probably the more immediate need in the midfield because if you bring in that kind of that that deeper role, um, deeper set of midfield, it allows as well. You know, Cal McGregor can push forward. He can play that a little bit more creatively. See, for Scotland, sometimes um, you know if if he's partnering um, more kind of Ryan Jack. Obviously, that won't be happening in the upcoming games. Um, but yeah, I, I like seeing McGregor that further, that bit further forward as well. You know, I think he's so good at everything, and that's why he is. I love him in that role. What I, was that, sorry? I love him in that role. Oh, I love absolutely. him as a number six. Yeah. I, I, somebody's mentioned Verratti in the comments here. You look at Verratti, you look at Pirlo. I love that type of player. But I do think there are certain times when McGregor can move that forward and we need that sort of 
a, a different type of player, and, yeah. and especially when we come up against better opposition. And there are actually including Rangers in that better opposition as well. You just need somebody who can control, um, you know, and is happy. Just like yeah, just basically happy to sit back and you know let all the the creative attacking guys go forward, and and you just sit back and you know have kind of the best seat in the house really. Um, but that is needed, and you know that that's so important in Europe. We've seen it so many times, you know, that you just think oh, if there was that man there, that ball maybe would not would not have got through, or the, the player wouldn't have had you know that half yard just to be able to cut inside. So I think that could be. Um, I've just seen the comment that you've starred. So bring it up, go on, bring it up. Um, this one. That one, yeah. That one. <laughs> um, probably have just described Nemanja Matic. Maybe a younger Nemanja Matic. I, I, I don't know. There's many, I mean, obviously, you've got Fabinho's the one that jumps out in my head. Anytime I watch Liverpool, I'm always impressed with the amount of work that Fabinho has to do to carry the other two in the middle of the park. And he, and he seems to be everywhere. And there was a couple of times when, you, when, when you've when you actually watched Ange Postacoglu's Celtic, you go, you do need somebody that's going to go, by the way, I need to go to the left, I need to go to the right here. I'm going to, I'm going to need to co cover up. Brown Warrior. He the Gucci's that man, Kev. I'd like that, to see that, it. That, that's what he says. I'd that's like what, to see it. I, I, I mean, I'd be up for it. I, I still have, I still have this impression that Ida Gucci is the, is the second, that is the classic song on the second album that's been held back. That, that has been held back. It's the Don't Look Back in Anger, which, which was written years before. Missed the first album, on the second album. Uh, uh, he could be that player, but I haven't seen enough of him. And any time that he has come on, apart from the game against Alawa, when he came on in the final game of the season, he did play further up because yes. beat, beat on had dropped in. Maybe that was just to get them game time. Who actually knows? But again... Having a look at his physicality, doesn't he look like the sort of player that I reckon that we need for Europe? But then that's me just getting it as Tony, like Tony Haggerty calls it the high test, and me knowing he haw about football. <laughs> Not at all. I do. I understand what you mean. Though you're wanting that, you know, beat on. We speak about even, you know, from set pieces that. At both ends, really, for starters, I don't think Beaton actually ever scored enough goals from from his head. You know, I think he, in, in any kind of set piece, he should have been up a, a hell of a lot quicker. But you're wanting somebody just with that little bit of stature. And I don't know, I, I am excited to see the Gucci. I really am. I didn't even think I'm in that deeper role because, as you say, when we've seen him come on, he, he always does press it a little bit further forward. But it'll be interesting to see what his favourite position is, you know. And if that is the deeper role for him, then I'm more than willing to, to try it out. And, you know, if, if that is his favourite favorite position, sorry, I'm sure Ange will give him a wee, a wee go there. He's a poster Cogley sign him. And Angie's brought him in. He's been unlucky with injuries. It was a horrific injury that he got at the Indo Drill Stadium uh, that night. It was an absolute horrible injury, which is tempered. Uh, he hasn't made the same impact as the other Japanese players at Celtic or any other uh, and poster Cogley signings. You can get physicality in other ways. And I sometimes I sometimes get bogged down when I see the term physicality. Maybe because I'm Scottish, they just see as a physicality as this big bruiser that goes around kicking folk. And when you look at European football, there's no many big bruisers now that get away with going about kicking folk. And it seems to be a, a dying art, but there seems to be more athletic types in the middle of the park. And when you have a look at the teams that got to... European when got to European finals, they all seem to have a bit more athletic types in the middle. And Neil's probably right, and I'm I'm going to give Neil his credit his credit there. We probably do need a bit more physicality. I reckon we need a bit more physicality at the back. I, th I think we need a bit more physicality in a number six, and that's not known what Idaguchi can do. I'm just as I say, I'm just giving it the eye test. We're desperately crying out for a left-footed centre half, though, Amy. No matter if Cameron Carter Vickers states uh, signs, and it must be a ball playing centre half as well. Yeah, there's there's no two ways about it. Carter Vickers signs if he does or if he doesn't, still need that that um, that left-footed centre half. Um, where you get him from, I do not know. Um, that's that's why I just paid the big bucks. Um, because oof, I, I don't have a clue on that one. I really don't. Um, I think we said the time and time again, which proves why it's so important that Celtic do sign up 
Cameron and Carter Vickers, it's so, so hard to find a, a decent centre-half out there, a ball-playing centre-half as well. Um, you've got plenty who think they can be ball-playing centre-halves, but they're really, really no. Um, and uh, it's, it's just a worry. So that I think that's actually going to be one of the toughest tasks this season. Between that and I think getting a backup goalkeeper, one who is happy to be a backup goalkeeper, I think that's actually going to be the two trickiest finds. Um, because I do believe, you know, that there are a few... I think there are forwards out there that we, we probably could entice or sh certainly should be able to entice. And if Ange is allowed the, I, a, a little bit of money, which I, I don't see why it shouldn't be um, allowed, that, then I, I think we could be OK in finding decent um, recruitments there. But yeah, the, the centre half is a real concern, even still, if, if Carter Vickers signs or not. It is. I, I, I says towards the end of the last season, I says it doesn't matter what happens with Cameron Carter Vickers, that we've got to bring in a left-footed centre half. And we can't go, and this, this is not a slight on Carl Starfelt whatsoever, but we need somebody more natural on the left-hand side. Yeah. And if you bring somebody in, it's more natural on Carl, Carl Starfelt on the left-hand side. And Cameron Carter Vickers doesn't doesn't actually sign in Starfelt moves to the right. It's a, it's it's a solution that's actually there that will still see Starfelt get game time. There have been a couple of hangways about like I think I've started an argument about physicality. Now. <laughs> what, what, what is physicality and what what, what isn't it? He, Ian, do we need physicality, Kev? I kind of say it quite quite often. No, I, I think we need athleticism. I'm going to change my terminology. I think we need athleticism at the back and in the middle of the park that we don't have at this precise moment in time. Uh, who, who, who was the other one who was on? Gary Oliver, Casamero is the exact type of modern modern tackler is. Not a hard man, but someone who covers ground, closes off space and nicks the ball. It's that type we need. Bang on, Gary. You should actually be proposing this and know me. Because <laughs> you, you, you have managed to hit it nail on the head. That's the type of mid midfielder I want, maybe. That's it. exactly what Gary Oliver says. I just don't want Casemiro. I, I don't like him as a player. I've never liked him <laughs> Real Madrid. Don't think we're going to get him away from Real Madrid either, um, thankfully. But no, I'm not, I have to say much. I'm not a fan of his. Um, but I understand that is the description that Gary gave. I would separate that actually from Casemiro. Um, but that is the, the description, as you say, that, that's pretty much hitting the nail on the head there. It did hit the nail on the head there, eh? Uh, let's see. Oh, Patrick James Simpson. I wonder if you saw this one. Kev, we had that in Kwasi, but he was never given his chance. Kwasi was a strange one, Amy, eh? Uh, yeah, he, he, um, he, I think, did you have high hopes? I don't know, but he went on that little run, didn't he? Getting a few games under his belt. Then there was just some mental tackling um, and some crazy cards getting thrown about. Um, and he just kind of like fell by the wayside. A, a strange one all round, I would say. Um, because I think there was, and I know I seem to say this all the time, but I do actually think there was a player in there. Um, was he given enough time? I do think he was because I remember him going on that that run of games and he was playing and there there just wasn't enough to say that you actually want this jersey. Um, but spent a little bit of money on him as well, didn't we? We did. It was one of these strange ones that we that we bought him after he'd only played was it eighteen games, something like that. And the majority of those games had been in the Europa League, and I think we took a punt and it just didn't work out. I, did he not get malaria or something like that as well? Was he no oh. injured for... Then Then he had, I think it was, was it a groin injury or a knee injury? He seemed to always be injured and, yes. never, and never really never, never really got in, into the side. He's one of those, he, he's one of those, one of those players though that, can you remember who we signed him from? Somewhere in France? Uh, no, it was, it was Russian. That was a Russian team. Was that? that we signed them for man. Wow. See that, that, that this is a problem. This is this is a problem with me with Project Celtic. There's Aye. players that we sign, we cannot name the clubs that we actually signed them from. Like uh, who was a big striker that went to Red Bull? Polish guy, Kamala. Who did we oh, sign Kamala Patrick for? Kamala, Patrick Kamala, yeah. Did we sign him from Eastern Europe, did we not? Okay, probably not. Patrick Kamala, he again. Remember that? I just remember the the let's get rocking. That's all that was all about. Uh -huh. 
many signs. And the, the announced that on TikTok, eh? That was never going to so. work. That was that was never going to work. We've got a couple of Gary Oliver says can can desire. And, aye, and Strange Off says Kazan, Ruben Kazan was signed with Kwasi. Oh. See, we, we can't even remember. No, Honestly, I could not tell you. Could not tell you. Bio as well. Who did, we, who did we sign Bio for? That was some club in I Bulgaria as well. Eh? Probably. See, at least, at least if we're signing it's guys. Crazy, exactly. Signing it's... guys like Yacht and Cameron Carter Vickers, at least they're coming for clubs that, we've, that we can actually remember, which is. Uh, Martin O'Neill was Candice it was Candice I think yeah. that, that, that's something that we need to move away from eh? we need to move away from these random random setting division guys that we look for we need we need to go for a bit of quality or we need to go for like players from clubs who Ange Postacoglu knows eh? exactly uh, I, th I think that's kind of what you've already seen under Ange Postacoglu, that, you know, he's dipping into markets that he is comfortable within. Um, and even if not, you know, you're, you're, you're signing players like Juranovic, who you're seeing on the European stage um, and you're seeing on the, the European Championship stage. Um, you know, Matt O'Reilly is obviously probably the the, the different case, really. Um, but I don't care who found Matt O'Reilly, where they found them. Um, I'm just glad that they found them. Um, so wh whoever gave that tip off, fair play. But no, I think that is something that we'll, well, I certainly hope it's something that we'll see that, you know, it doesn't appear, Ange, to, to be one of those panic signings. We kind of said that after January when the women were kind of reflecting and reviewing it, that it was very uncertain, like that there were no panic buys on the 29th of January, no loan deals from, like you say, some... Slovakian clubs, some Slovenian club, Polish third division, that you're just like, I don't know where that we got these guys from. Um, so to kind of dip into those markets instead, I, I think that's that's where Celtic um, will want to be going. Um, and I think that's where Ange probably does feel most comfortable and where he certainly from now looks like where he's uh, wanting to dip into. I definitely. I'm just trying to block that thing. It's spamming uh, the, <laughs> the, the the comments at this precise moment in time. Aye, uh, we, we we need we need to move, we need to move on to that. We'll, we'll talk about Rio Hatati because he's been he's been in the the papers over the weekend talking about a uh, his mad eighteen months that he's had. It started off winning the league in Japan, playing in the Olympics, now winning winning the league at Celtic eh? and what he actually says is eh, and he's talking about his, his Glasgow Derby debut here eh? he says I'm just glad my years of work have prepared me for an occasion like that but when it comes to what happened against Rangers with my goals I think God was on my side I remember getting goosebumps, goosebumps the first time I went on the pitch just before kickoff. I was really nervous about that. Then I was calm. I felt the atmosphere and the fact that it blended into, in, into the pitch. But what he actually then says after it was, but I think people played me differently after that. The marking became tighter, more physical. Players would catch me on the ankle more when they were going for the ball. I think the opponents watched that game and thought, I have to do this now. So basically Rio Tati's saying that he's basically Rio Tati's saying he's getting kicked about the park in Scottish football. Summing up, Kev. Um I I understand the comments I do, and you know what? I think that's just gonna be part and parcel when you put in a performance like that. Um I think the fact that he's managed to, to kind of deal with it speaks volumes. Um, I'll be honest, I'm just really excited to see when they, you know, uh, with Maeda, with Hadati and Itaguchi, when you've got a full season. Um, and well, when First off, actually, when they have a little bit of a break and then you get to see them going right from the start of the season. But I think... Um, I think they can hit unbelievable heights under Ange Postacoglu. I hope they're enjoying a little bit of a break right now. Um, you know, you're seeing them both back out in Japan, um, which I think is great. Love the reception that um, Maeda got at Yokohama. I um, think that's so classy. I really do. I love that. Um, and yeah, a little bit of break, come back and, and really have a full season under their belts at Celtic under Ange. I think it could just um, be a, a really, really exciting time. Um Hatati, you could see probably him more so than the Maeda, probably tiring a little bit towards the end of the season, and I've not got a problem with that. Um, you know, nobody's going, nobody's blaming him. Um, I certainly would be. Um, 
and you know the fact that he's seen that he felt he was marked a little bit more tightly um up and or oh, sorry certainly after the Rangers game then you can understand maybe why he was feeling the effects a little bit more um so I think that the comments you know I think he's saying what he's saying and if that's how he feels it's fine by me but as long as you know he doesn't use that as an excuse which I don't really see him doing so I don't think that's the, the nature of the comments at all um you know it's just kind of welcome to Scottish football when you make that big an impact that he'd done um and you know nobody just nobody's wanting to make sure that he's allowed to strike basically from 20 yards out I think it doesn't help when when you get when you get you score that goal against Hearts and the first game against Hibs that he played at Celtic Park, he gave us something, a completely different dynamic that night with his early passing and stuff like that. He then has to try to adjust to the game of Scottish football, the, the pace of Scottish football. And he signed with us. It's a big move. It's a massive move to Europe for him. And he's he's got adrenaline at that point, and he's actually running on adrenaline at that point. Then the next thing he knows that, he finds that it's a bit more physical, it's a bit quicker than what he's actually used to. He's got that mental tiredness. I think he's actually been quite open about that there is a mental tiredness that he's actually got as well. And the players do get tighter to him because they realise that he's dropping into wee pockets of space and, and they, they, they read what he's going to do. It also doesn't matter that you get somebody like Michael Stewart gone, but they've only spent £2 million on that player. He... He, he's worth far, far more. I think it's something that he'll develop in the, the mid, uh, develop in the coming season, and it, it is a really interesting story. I thought his appearance in that Japanese version of Soccer AM was utterly bizarre. It was a weird programme. Um, I, I don't really know what it was, if it was like kind of like Soccer AM and the one show almost kind of put together, wasn't it? Um, aye, it was, it. <laughs> Aye, uh, it's just a bit, like, this is a bit strange. Um, I have to say, I really enjoyed the the um, the translations, uh, the the feed or the thread, sorry, from from Dan. Um, I thought there were some interesting points in it, but yeah, um, I think it just shows maybe how footballers are seen elsewhere. Um, but I don't know, maybe that's just kind of the way they're going because this is actually totally on Celtic, but. Um, Harry Kane was on was it Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon last week out in America and you're just I can't remember which one it was now it certainly wasn't James Corden because I thought that would have made more sense but either Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon and Harry, Harry Kane's out on that I don't know it's not really not while players are still playing you rarely see them go on these kind of talk shows um, I think you know when you retire, absolutely, I get that. When you become more a, a celebrity, really, but for to be still be a playing player and to go and do that, I don't know. I, I'll be honest, probably not my cup of tea. And like you say, going by the kind of setup and uh, questions that were asked, um, that on 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 that Japanese show, I'm not sure. Like you say, if it was a soccer AM or if it was a one show. Or if it was someone else. This is your like, life because he's exactly this morning or something. Uh, his, his parents appeared in the <laughs> LA. I think as well, it's, that's just an insight into Japanese culture that they do not think twice about doing yeah. something like that and asking in depth questions of current players and want to get those, want to get to know those players really, like, really well. What I did find interesting was. The fact that he didn't really know Kyogo. Yes. And and this is the sort of thing that that we got we we kind of maybe all says all the all the Japanese guys will maybe stick together in, in Glasgow. And his interview proved that isn't the case whatsoever, that he didn't really know Kyogo. Yeah, he's and, enjoying getting to know him, like you say, and uh, uh, having a little bit of a laugh with him now, a um, little bit of a joker. But yeah, to um, they, they, I'll agree with you, those were kind of, probably actually surprising, yeah, that like, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I understand Japan's a big country, but you, I think you do, you just kind of maybe have that assumption that because I think the fact that Hipate and Maeda were both linked for so long, um, when Kyogo especially was out injured as well at that time, you would maybe um, uh, maybe assume that there would have been some sort of um, conversion or something like that, but no, it was, um, yeah, 
yeah, probably a bit of a shock to to hear that. But I, I, as long I, as they're starting to get on now, I, I'm not. I'm not really saying that they would have knew each other from yes. Japan. Because, but I'm talking about when they come here. kyogo has been here four months before, mm-hmm. so you, you 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 maybe would have thought there would have been some part of right. Let's all really hang a book together, and I'll, I'll show you the ropes. Whereas that that. It's quite clear for that interview with Atati that never really happened. Maybe that's just knowing Kyogo's nature. Maybe that, I mean, I mean, they are completely four different, like, four different characters. But I just found, like, the openness that the, that Japanese show wanted them to be was, and he's still young. I mean, they were asking about why you're not married at 23. That I that, found really strange. That, that I that, think that's, that's, that's a look in the... Um, you know, that would, I certainly don't think that would ever be asked over here now. Um, but I, I think that shows times changing. It's quite funny, actually, uh, that um, just on that kind of topic of, like, marriage. And we were just, I think it was Gary Burkey, who's, um, he's a Dundee fan, actually, but he's a, he works with the Terrace and um, a journalist. Very, very good. His, his Twitter is actually very funny as well a lot of the time. But he found, oh, what season was it from? 98, 90s, it's in the 90s or something, I'm sure it's in the 90s, or is it maybe O2, Lee McCulloch's at Motherwell, put it that way, um, Reggie Blinkers at Celtic, um, and it was one of these Scottish football magazine kind of things, can't even for the life of me remember what it is, but basically it was like an insight to each player, and like I say, it was Ali McCoy's at, at, um, at, at Kelly, there was Lee McCulloch at, at, um, at Hearts, Reggie Blinker was a Celtic player, and one of the questions was pin up. And I sent it in our group chat, and I was like, "Can you imagine that nowadays? If if you know any Celtic player or whatever was asked, who is your pin up? So even just 20, 25 years ago, that was a question. But yeah, I think that certainly those days are, are gone. Um, within I would say Scottish football media, you certainly hope, and, and probably just in, in British. But yeah, for that, just that'd be a question, you know, for a twenty three year old out in Japan. I'm twenty one, and I'll be honest, I'm nowhere near thinking about marriage right now um and i just think yeah to, to press yeah probably to pressurize as well because it was it was quite intensive you know and he had to say oh, i'm only just out of uni a few years ago oh, it's not really my thing and yeah i found yeah i'll be honest that i thought that one was a little bit strange yeah martin o'neill comes in and he is quite right that would be more of a japanese cultural yeah. thing and but i mean us comment on it just means we just found it weird that you would ask a professional football player on a program like on a on a on a sports program, like you, you go, that's not the type of. Co- but we're we're just used to an in banter interviews. I think. Yeah. Uh, what were the nights? What were the nights out like, my mate, and stuff like that? Eh, where the Japan, where this program got really really in depth. And uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, John Kane as well. Ange himself warned about clubbing uh, them together because they're Japanese. He said they're individuals. And I think we jumped to a lot of conclusions as well. But then Edward Y of Oz comes in and says, Nero and Abada got on like a like a house on fire. Just, I think it just shows anyway, we just can't make assumptions that yeah. just, be, just because an Australian comes in that he's going to be he's going to be friends with any other Australians in the in the squad. Uh, just because a Japanese player comes in and he's going to be hang, hanging about with the Japanese players. I mean, you have a look at the... Who, who would have put Yacht and Carl Starfelt going to IB for the girl? I wouldn't know. I certainly wouldn't know. I'll be honest, I would not have, no. <laughs> so <laughs> it's Stevie Welsh on the holiday with them either, my goodness. It was, I was just not saying anything, but it was just like, I spot the Scotsman in that photo, eh? like, so pale. <laughs> um, already got a wee bit of sunburn and it's only been 10 degrees outside, but um, no... It, it's, I think they're a bad and you beat someone as well. I just think you could probably see that was like you know just the experience heading and quite a young guy as well taking him under his wing. Um, it was kind of like that big brother approach. You could certainly see that. Um, and you know there's been lots on social media about a bad bless him, but um, it was yeah you're going to have some friendships relationships that make sense, and then like you say you're going to have Carol Starfield and Jota heading off to Ibiza. <laughs> Who would have said that five months ago? I know, and meeting the Cameron Carter Vickers across there. Then you then you had another picture that came out with Greg Taylor with Ryan Christie and Shane, Shane Duffy, Duffy and Christopher Ayer. Exactly. That's, Crazy. Crazy. This shows you we know nothing. We know nothing no, what's no going nothing on exactly. in, going on in the dressing room. 
We do know something that's happening on Wednesday night at Hamden, and there will be a Celtic interest in that. Um, Callum McGregor's been wheeled out in front of the press over the last couple of days to do the talking for the Scotland camp. And I said to you before we came on air, Amy, that any sort of excitement that I've had for this playoff game has now disappeared because of circumstances uh, over that's just circumstance. Everybody knows what the circumstances are. And I, and I was wondering about the mindset of the players going into this game, not just the Scottish players, but the, the Ukrainian players as well. Uh, McGregor actually says, I think there's a balance to be struck. When the game kicks off, we have to go. We appreciate the situation. It's really tough to see. We flick on the news every day and something else has happened. It's, hor it's a horrific situation. But we have a game of football to play on Wednesday and they'll just be as motivated as us to win. That sport, when, when the game comes, you have to put everything to one side and do everything to win. They can't have more motivation than us. It can't be. We've waited a really, really long time to have the opportunity to get back to the World Cup so their motivation can't be any more than ours. That's a professional football football player's opinion that eh? and, they, and it's quite clear to see that in Cal McGregor's head, they've, they've already went through the situation that the, the Ukrainian players might be more motivated because of the completely what's happening in their country at the moment. I'll be honest, it's it's a horrible, horrible um, situation altogether. You know, um, I, I think you know when the game was kind of postponed, I, I think rather. I don't know, arguably ridiculously, some people maybe assume things would maybe be more pleasant right now, but that's not the case. You know, the situation is worsening every single day. Um, it's really tricky because I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say something that people don't like, but it's it's tough because it's only a game of football, um, you know, and there's real, real life stuff out, happening out in Ukraine. So I, I'll be, I feel for actually any Scotland player right now who's actually having to come out and talk about it because if, you know, you say one half sentence wrong, somebody's going to try and turn that and, and turn it against, you know, the, the team and I, I do think that whoever's came out and spoke to Callum McGregor I think um, Andy Robertson obviously has been as well, he's been speaking to the press and I think so far they've held their, their own really well because you know nobody wants this situation at all you know and it's horrible and he, he's spot on, nobody can turn away from it um, so I understand the comments because you know everybody in the world is going to be rooting for Ukraine, you know, and if it wasn't the fact that they were against Scotland, I'd be rooting for Ukraine. Um, it's, it's it's tricky because in the same breath, you know, I'll be honest, I've listened to um, Zinchenko and and uh, obviously the, the Man City player, he'd done a, a little interview last week and, and he said himself that, you know, Ukraine don't want sympathy. Um, I've just seen you start that comment. Um they, they just want to treat it as a game of football. How you do that, I'll be honest, I do not know. Um, but it, it's, it's it's kind of, as we said before coming on air, it's, yeah, this is the closest I've, uh, Scotland have been in my lifetime to even getting near a World Cup. You know, we're still two massive games away. Um, so there is an excitement and there is always going to be a motivation, but it certainly has been dampened. The tone has been dampened, you know, since mm -hmm. the, the unbelievable atmospheres, you know, you think back to October, November and, and playing against Denmark and incredible wins, like really, Aye. really incredible performances on a total high. Like I've never experienced a highlight last year of support in Scotland, making a major tournament and then beating Denmark. My God, how the hell do we beat Denmark? Um, and now to this, because you know, after the game of football, it's it's everything goes back to real life. And I think the ninety minutes for Ukraine that'll probably be the biggest relief they've had. Um, you know, and you hope that it brings their people something to 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 cheer about but I don't. You know, thankfully, thankfully, never been in that situation. So. Can you be cheerful? I, I really, really don't know. It's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible incident altogether. And just to, yeah, to have to go through with this, I just think it, it's, I don't know. Uh, you're going to sound a bad person either way, aren't you? Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation that um, 
FIFA have put both associations in, I think. But FIFA would have took guidance for the Ukrainian FA. And yes. A lot of those players, all the Ukrainian players are still playing. They, they, they're not, they're playing all over Europe and they've, and they've been playing up until a couple of weeks ago. They will want to play the game and they want to get through on sport and merit only. And you would probably have said that the Ukrainian FA probably and the players wouldn't want to have got a bye in the final. They would say, no, we want to play it. If we are able to play, we want to play it. From a Scotland point of view, I just wish it wasn't us that was playing them. I wish it was somebody else that didn't have this emotional <laughs> sort of tug of war that you've actually got here in this game. And that, that could work against the Ukrainian players as well because I think this will probably be their first game since the war maybe broke yeah, out. I might, yeah. I, might, I, might, I might be wrong in that. Hey, uh, you played that club, I'm sure... They played, they played Werder Bremen. No, yes. Borussia Mönchengladbach. They played the, Borussia Mönchengladbach. Aye. So they've got together once, but this is a massive one. The whole of the world's going to be watching this one for them. And that might get... Emotion might get in the way of actually playing a game of football there. Eh? We can only hope Scotland do well. I do want Scotland to go through eh, because I want to see Scotland in a World Cup. And it will throw up an interesting playoff game, a home nation playoff game against Wales. Uh, again, so I do want Scotland to go through. I want Callum McGregor to do well. It'd be brilliant to see Callum McGregor at a World Cup. I think his career actually deserves it as well. But it's a strange week for Scottish football for me anyway. Yeah, it's it's not going to be one that's forgotten anytime soon, no matter how it goes. Um, but it is a huge week. And, you know, you've just got... You, let's just hope it's a, it's a great game of football in all honesty. But, um, yeah... Uh, just give it. Nobody else is going to be supporting Scotland, so um, we better make sure that we do. Definitely. Amy, it's been brilliant. Um, Stephen, Stephen Kenny comes in. Turnbull fit as 12 goals a season minimum. I kind of agree with that as well. I think he has a goal scoring threat from the middle of the park. Paddy Laverty in the urban coaching. No, I didn't cut myself off deliberately to, to make Amy <laughs> panic. <laughs> I saw he's in the comments actually suggesting that I'd done that. <laughs> no, I didn't. I pressed the wrong button on my mouse. So I <laughs> apologise. <laughs> Everybody, it's been brilliant. It's been a Monday. Thank you very much for tuning in and I'll speak to you all later. See you later. Hey, hey.